knowledge. All right. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Well, praise God. It's Palm Sunday. How many brought your palms? <laughs> we used to try to get the palm leaves and raise them, but we can we can raise our our palms that are on our branches, right, on our limbs. Uh, it is Palm Sunday, and so, uh, but tonight we are having Bible study fellowship at 6 o'clock and everything else, and of course this Friday is Good Friday, even though it's a sad day, it's a good day because of what it meant for us and what it was beginning to mean for us, and the next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday, so praise God for that, we're excited about all those things. So let's stand, and let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to celebrate uh, Jesus today. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you, Lord, for each person that's here and that's joining us today. I pray that you would be glorified in all that we do and say, Lord God, I pray that, God, we would remember that, Lord, as we celebrate this time, Lord God, what it means, this, this Passion Week or this Passover Week, Father God, of, uh, of just the celebration and the remembrance of them being set free from uh, the Egyptians but also, God, that we've been set free from our sins. We thank you for that, God. Lord, I ask that you would have your will and your way today in all we do and say in Jesus' name. Amen. Greet somebody.
of Olives into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, that Sunday before his death and resurrection. His disciples and the multitude began shouting, Blessed Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Pharisees went to Jesus and said, Tell your disciples to stop saying that. They need to be quiet. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, if they are not crying out praises, that the stones would cry out in their place. I don't know about you, but I don't want any stone crying out in my place. My God and my Savior Jesus deserves my praise not your praise for me. He deserves my praise. He deserves your praise from you. Your breath that is in your lungs was a gift from him to you. To sing and to shout praises unto him. Stop holding back worshiping the Lord. Stop holding back and giving more worship to other things what you give to him because he deserves it.
Praise God. Amen. Let's pray over the offering. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for these gifts. And Lord, how you bless this church. And you continue to bless us, Lord God, in the faithfulness of your people, Lord. Uh, I pray that, God, they would just see, God, the, the storehouses of heaven opened up in each of our lives, Lord God. Not for our glory, Lord God, for our benefit, but for your glory to, as, Lord, we are able to bless others, Lord God, and share the good news of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Oh, goodness. Man, the Lord is here this morning. Amen. Amen. Um, I just expect a good report from your sister. This, yeah, that that was really. An, <laughs> I don't know. I just I could just see that just running down, down through her skeletal system and everything. I mean, just yeah. So, glory to God. That was, and that's that's God. That's how God works. You know. Um, People who say that miracles aren't for today, that healings aren't for today, that the gifts of the Spirit aren't for today, obviously never read the entire New Testament and uh, understanding how how God works, amen? Because uh, he, did, he did healings and stuff like that in the Old Testament, did them in the New Testament, and at no time did he ever say to stop or that it's going to stop except... And this is where a lot of people get confused, 1 Corinthians 13, where there's prophecy, where there's tongues and all that. They will cease because that's going to cease whenever 
Jesus comes uh, for the millennial reign and we reign and rule with him uh, for all eternity because we won't, we won't need those things anymore. We're not going to need healing because we're not going to have sickness. We're not going to have disease. There'll be no crying over there. Amen. Uh, we won't need to. We'll, we'll all proclaim the, the goodness of God and 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 singing and, and that kind of stuff. And, and as we're doing whatever we're going to be doing, uh, in the same language and in the same whatever, and you know, we're all going to understand it. It's, it's not going to have to be done for those things. For as Paul said in First Corinthians fourteen, that uh, yeah, we we have a we pray in the spirit, but there are those times that we're given a message in in tongues or other languages, and in, uh, for the crowd and a interpretation, and that benefits all of us. But it is a sign to the unbeliever. It is a sign to the unbeliever, uh, a word of prophecy, a prophetic word of encouragement and direction, whatever for us personally is, is for the body. And uh, I'm not trying to teach on that right now, but I just felt like we just needed to remember that and uh, remember that uh, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Amen. Father, we just bring this word to you today and we ask that you would bless it, Lord God, that it would accomplish your will, your purpose in this room and online and around the world, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So as I was saying in Sunday school earlier, uh, trying to, uh, uh, as I was praying and figuring out, you know, we're talking about Jericho, or we're talking about uh, Joshua, and then it's Palm Sunday, and obviously we're not going to be talking about Joshua next week because of it being Resurrection Sunday, but of which way to go here and, and teach one in Sunday school and the other in regular service. And, and so we, this morning we talked about um, Palm Sunday and what that all represented and what it was meaning and some uh, historical and geological facts uh, of where Jesus was traveling uh, from and to during what's called Passover week, which, it, which for us began this last Friday and Passover ends on next Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Uh, and so uh, the everything around it, well, a similarity and not so much of a of a um, uh, a coincidence. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> is, uh, she knew what I meant. What I was trying to find is the fact that um, uh, that the beginning of Passover week, Jesus started out at. Jericho. Now, as you read the story of Jericho, and like we're going to do today, uh, you know after they defeated Jericho and did all the things there, uh, that Joshua proclaimed a curse over the next person if anybody tried to rebuild Jericho, that it would cost them their firstborn son. And it did, because later on a man, uh, I can't think of which one it was off the top of my head, rebuilt it. And law and his son died, and so uh, it, it actually happened. But the city, not with the walls and everything, is still there. That area, that region, and so it, it was when when Jesus was coming through. And so at the beginning of Passover, he comes into Jericho, and so we're going to be talking about Jericho this morning. Uh, we're going to start at Joshua chapter five, verse thirteen, is where. We are going to see this finally coming through uh, to take place. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said something and put that uh, on Scott. Uh, Scott Holbert texted me earlier, and I wasn't sure if I could share it, but he just did online. Uh, he is 61 days sober. Oh, praise, praise God. God. Give the Lord a hand for that. Amen. That's a miracle, and he's asking us to pray that he continues on. So write that down, Julian. We'll pray at the end of the service. Uh, so that's awesome. Praise God. That's, uh, that's, that's good. That's really good. Um, so anyways, Joshua chapter five, beginning with verse 13 and, and God, God knows what he's doing. There's so many things running through my head right now about, uh, Passover week, Holy week, Jesus coming from Jer Jericho down to Jerusalem and us on, uh, Jericho. But Joshua, 
okay, after they, they, they crossed the river, the Jordan River, God parted the, the waters, they come across, uh, they, uh, the, the new generation gets circumcised, renews the covenant, they have their first Passover, there we go again, they celebrated, come on, somebody got to see that this is not a coincidence, they celebrated Passover in Canaan and ate of the fruit of the land. And then from that day forward, the manna stopped and didn't, didn't come again because they didn't need it. And verse 13 says, when Joshua was by Jericho, they encamped near Jericho at this time, looked up and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. So here we are. Come on. I, I don't know. Are, are, am I the only one getting excited in, in my brain and in my heart about this? About the similarities and how God's plan for humanity, for his people, and for the Gentile nations that would come to him and accept him, is just laced all throughout the Bible, the Old Testament into the New Testament. And here we see he's, he's walking around. I... The, the kind of the assumption is he's thinking about what is he got to do next and he's seeking God because he's sought God in the past and he's heard from God and he sees a man standing with a sword drawn in his hand. Okay? Uh, and Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? That's a very logical question, isn't it? Because he knew this was a heavenly man. This wasn't, um, man, you know, we, our culture and our ideas of what angels look like and what angels are and all that stuff has, uh, it, it, it's so convoluted. Because every time you see an angel uh, figurine or anything like that, for one, they're always female with wings and stuff. Technically, angels didn't have wings. Cherubim or cherubim and seraphim were the ones that had the wings, and those were a different creature, okay? So this was a man standing there before him, uh, and, a, and, and he's got this sword out, so you can only imagine that you're seeing this, and you're like, okay, this has got, he's thinking probably in the back of his head, this is part of God's plan, but I'm just going to be sure. <laughs> Are you for us or for the enemy? You know, it's kind of like the old movies and the old things, you know. Uh, uh, who goes there? You know, and the, the, the military guys on guard, you know, friend or foe? That's what he was asking. Friend or foe? And uh, he says neither <laughs> at first. But he says, uh, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. Whoa, the commander of the army of the Lord. We know from more scriptures and, and revelation that there are myriads and myriads, thousands upon thousands of God's holy angels that are, uh, that are warriors. They are warring angels, we call them. And this guy, this angel is the commander of all of them. He's the top dog. God sent, at that moment, God sent the, the one that he has in command of all of his army. And so he's, he's basically getting ready. It's a sign, okay? He says, it says, And then Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And so Joshua did that, <coughs> all right? Gives you a little more indication of who that possibly was uh, and not just any old angel, okay? Um, and so he does it. He, I mean, he's like, whoo, the commander of the Lord's army pff, hits the ground. What am I supposed to do? What, what do you need from me? Well, take your shoes off for one thing because you're standing on the holy ground. Like when the Lord spoke to Moses out of, from the burning bush, and was appeared to him in a burning bush um, and said, take your shoes off for the place where you are standing is holy. And so he goes in and begins to give Joshua the plan for victory. He gives him a plan for victory. 
uh, chapter 6, verse 1. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. All right, so remember, through the Israelites fleeing Egypt and crossing the Red Sea, even though it had been over 40 years before, but then freshly in their mind, of course, they had also, uh, during that 40 years, had defeated those two uh, bad kings. And then they just recently crossed the Jordan River, and now they are going to conquer Jericho. Jericho was afraid. The people of Jericho were afraid. They were terrified. They heard about all the things. Now, we know some of the stories and, and the, the possibilities of, of Jericho. Uh, it was a fortress city. I told you earlier, it sits in the uh, it sat in the Jordan Valley and was actually about 800 feet or so below sea level. Um, it was a place of refuge and protection. Uh, it was a uh, fortress city. Uh, the residents of the city as well as those in the surrounding countryside could come in. Uh, the walls were have been as much as 30 feet high and 20 feet thick. All right, think about that for a moment. Let's just see. One, two, three, four, five. So from here to that back wall is about how thick that those walls were. That's pretty thick. Hey Amen, that's, that's, that's pretty thick. And that much and 10 more feet tall. All right, uh, chariots, stuff raced on top of them. Could ride on top of them. And remember Rahab, her house was built into the wall, was part of that wall. And so uh, they were afraid. Another interesting fact about uh, Jericho, I was trying to, uh, how can I put this in terms, just for you to get an idea about how big the place. If you take the sitting area, the seat area, not, not the uh, circles on each end that you walk down, the ramps, but the seating area and the field, that, that area of Arrowhead Stadium, was about the size of Jericho. It was about that size. Eight, eight acres. Y'all, most of you know what eight acres would look like anyways. But just that kind of deal. Imagine if, if Arrowhead was a small city with walls like that. All right? And so, uh, but it was, it was tightly shut up. But it was, it was instrumental in, in, for them to complete their con well to help complete their conquest in taking uh, the land of Canaan and what it would be a message to the Canaanites. Now the people of Jericho were were, were Canaanites and they uh, they worshipped the Canaanite gods and they thought the Canaanite gods could protect them. Okay, they thought that those evil spirits that they were really worshiping could defend them and protect them. But as everywhere the Israelites went, everybody always declared and knew that the God of Israel was the God above all gods, the King of all kings, the, the Lord of all lords. He was the top God, all right? He was it. And so the, they thought they were safe. But the, the angel, uh, this man, gives Joshua these directions. And, and he, he's given, well, it says, and the Lord said. So was this what we would call a theophany, was this actually Jesus still in his heavenly form, not as human flesh, but he's the one down here. Because it says, And the Lord said to him, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and its mighty men of valor. And then he begins to tell them that here's what you're going to do. Here's how you're going to win this battle. And remember, God's ways are higher than our ways. And sometimes we look at what God's asking us to do and we think, you're nuts, God. What's, this is crazy. You know, this doesn't make sense. But it says, you shall march around the city, all the men of war, of war going around the city once, thus shall you do for six days. Okay? Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priest shall blow the trumpets. 
And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, or it'll fall uh, under itself. And the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. So Joshua tells the people, here's what we're going to do, here's what you're going to do, and, and you can't say a word, don't make a peep, except the priests that are, each time they go around, they're blowing the horns, the, the ram's horns. And that's all they're doing until the seventh day, the seventh time of the seventh day. And whenever they do that, then you're going to hear the ram's horns and we're all going to shout. And when we all shout, the wall is going to fall and we're going to go in and we're going to destroy all the devoted things, which everything was to be devoted unto the Lord. Livestock, lives, people's lives, uh, and gold, silver, everything was to be destroyed, which they burned up later, uh, except Rahab and anybody that was in her house because of their promise of covenant they had made. This was, this was a, an act of obedience. It, it was not just, I don't know, maybe, maybe there, you know, there could have been in, you know, God uses, God uses us and he uses what we would call natural things to accomplish his will, to accomplish his plans. He spoke the earth into existence, the universe into existence. Um, but he uses us. He likes to use us and, and test our obedience to him. But, uh, and, and so in this, was there something uh, 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 like from physics and scientifically, you know, possible about, you know, what they did and the marching. I know some people, you know, people would say, oh, well, it was, they, they loosened it up. They, they shook it. And then the, the sound of all these thousands and thousands and maybe a million people uh, shouting, you know, vibrated and the walls fell down. If that is the case, it is because that's how, what God used. But it was a miracle. I mean, they really didn't have anything of that capacity to do that. I mean, you know, when you are, speaking of Arrowhead Stadium, you know, when you have, how many does that hold? 70,000 people? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that they shout, you know, and it gets up to 148 decibels, I think. It's, you know, got the world record. But the walls don't fall flat, thank God. <laughs> the seats don't fall flat. So it's a mix of the obedience of the people of God and the power of God. And, and so this was showing them, and it shows us that if we will trust in the Lord and obey the Lord, he has his, his power and his resources available for us, like these roaring, warring angels and this, this messenger angel, Jesus himself, uh, still in his, his heavenly form, that came down and said, Basically, heaven is, the power of God's at your disposal, but you've got to follow the plan. You've got to follow the plan. And they may not have understood, and they may not have uh, the, the significance of all that, but you and I, you remember Hebrews 11 says, the people of faith, they looked forward to something that they could not grasp. We can grasp it because we have it to look back on. We have the, the whole Bible to look back on. Uh, Old Testament and New Testament. And so we can look at all the times that God did things in sevens. Right? He said, you're going to march around one time a day for six days, but then on the seventh day, you're going to march around seven times. And you're going to take seven priests with seven ram's horns and, and there are seven trumpets of ram's horns. And you're going to do these things there was so much significance in this relating back to the six days of creation and the seventh day that was the Sabbath, the holy day, the day of rest. That you go on and you see the time when Naaman uh, had to had a dip in the, in, in the Jordan River to get free from leprosy and he had to dip seven times. You know, uh, Elijah sent the servant out seven times to see uh, if there was clouds coming as he had prayed and, and had declared, prophesied that rain was getting ready to come. And no, no clouds, no clouds. And then on the seventh time out, he's seen a cloud the size of a man's hand. 
And then he said, get ready, it's fixing to pour. And then he took off running. And he outran Ahab's chariot. All right? And, and so there's, there's so many other times that we see this. And in Hebrew, the word seven is pronounced Sheba or Sheba. All right? And it means it is a number of completion. And this God was showing them, if you will obey me, I'm going to complete this great exploit, this great thing. And it is going to be a sign to everyone around that you serve the God of all creation, the, the God who is above every God, that, and, and that I am on your side, and you are my people. It is going to be a, a, a great a, a, a great uh, exploit for all those people around to see that the God of Israel is the God above all gods. And you know what? They did it. They followed through with the plan. They followed through with the plan. They went through once a day, marched around, the trumpets play it. Seventh day, they went around seven times on the seventh time. You know the story. They blew the trumpets and the people shouted. <coughs> and then they... The walls fell flat and they ran up and did what they were supposed to do. There's so much similarity and so much foreshadowing here of what Jesus did during Passover week with them having just celebrated Passover. And on his journey, as he began Passover week, uh, some... 1,500 years later, somewhere around there, maybe 1,000 years later, that he starts in Jericho and goes to Jerusalem. Are, is any of that clicking for you? They were going to the promised land where God was establishing a place for him to be worshipped for such that time until the end time when Jesus would establish the throne in that same place. They set up the temple. They built the temple there at Jerusalem. And then it was, uh, it was torn down. And then another temple was built. And then it was torn down. And all that was, was destroyed. And that's why to this day, one of the signs of the very, of the, the tribulation upon us is the rebuilding of the third temple on the Temple Mount that the Antichrist will go into and, and have the, commit the abomination that causes desolation, but that Jesus, when he runs them out, and he will set up inside of. They are, they are working behind the scenes right now to set that up. They are practicing the old sacrifices and the different things of, of uh, the unleavened bread, which they still celebrate, but, but the, with the sheep and all the, the ways of, uh, of the show bread that was in the, the tabernacle, they're already practicing those things, training up uh, their, their priests and, and their servants to do that, to make the bread, and that, that stayed there until the end, and then they, they ate it and made more in the new bread for the next, for the, uh, each time that the, uh, each shift, basically each week, the next shift that came in of, of priest to serve in the temple. And they're already practicing these things. They're working to set the, the, these things are in motion right now, church. These things are in motion right now. That's the day and age that you and I are living in. But how that they were going through there and had to go through Jericho to enter in. Yeah, they, they are into the promised land, but to get to that final spot, Jesus goes that way and establishes his spiritual kingdom whenever he died on the cross and he rose again at Jerusalem. There, in that same place, that place that they were going to, that he was going to go to, that he's going to, or he went that time, that he's going to go back to whenever he, <laughs> he establishes the kingdom for a thousand years, that millennial reign. You see, he, he has a plan. Everything is a, everything that, that seven is just laced through there is just is a sign for you and I 
that it means something to God and it is a sign of completion. Daniel's 70 <laughs> weeks or 70 sevens, 70 weeks of sevens. We look at, uh, uh, we look at the tribulation that is, a, is, is thought to be that, that 70th week, which is a seven-year period, all right? That it's all laced throughout, a sign of completion. Whenever the disciples asked, when Jesus said, you should forgive uh, those that sin against you, and they said, how many times? Seven times? You remember what Jesus said? Jesus said 70 times seven. A lot of, you know, forever, you know, you're like, well, is that 490 times? Does that mean we're just, we just keep, we just keep forgiving them? It is an illusion and it eludes, not illusion, but illusion, eludes back to the prophecy of Daniel and the 77s, which that completion of whenever the Jesus is going to conquer the world, all his enemies at the end of the tribulation to that 70th seven, was he alluding to that? Because after that, we... We're not going to be sinning against each other, are we? <laughs> That's till the end. As we're told so many times throughout the New Testament and all through the book of Revelation, if you will endure till the end, when people say, well, salvation, uh, you, we have guaranteed salvation. Yes, if you stay in it and you continue to follow Jesus, he said, pick up your cross and follow me. Don't stop. Don't give up. Don't pull away. Don't commit what we call personal apostasy that, that many people believe is not possible. But yet, Jesus himself said, you have to follow me and endure till the end. And people in the New Testament and others gave up and they turned away. They did not endure to the end. Just like salvation in the Old Testament, what was considered to make you, we talked about this last week, considered to make you part of God's family, was circumcision, right? For the men, it was it was the circumcision, and that meant them and, and their wives and their family were God's family. They were, for intents and purposes, they were saved. But how many of them committed sin and turned? And God said, you'll not enter my promised land. It's the same way with us. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we've got to follow him to the end. But he, we will obey him and we will follow him and be faithful to him. He will supply our needs. He will bless us and he will get us through. And if we die in the process, we're going to be with him anyways in glory. Amen. But he's not looking for wishy-washy Christians. He had been telling, you know, remember this, whenever he led them out of Egypt and, and Moses sent the spies out to Canaan to, to spy out the land and they were scared, weren't they? Oh, it's, yeah, that, that may be what God said, but oh, it's terrifying. We can't do it. And they didn't get to, except for the younger generation. And it was even then, whenever they started coming along, I'm sure it was scary to them, but they trusted God and they made it into the promised land. What Jesus' plan was, was scary. And he even prayed, God, if it's not your will, take let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He was tempted over and over again by the enemy uh, to, to give up, to bow down, to worship him, and, and, and let him be declared. You know, you worship me, and, and I'll give you all this stuff. And, and all that, he had time after time, and even out of the mouth of his own disciple. Peter, to give up. No, Lord, you're never going to die. We'll never let that happen. And he said, get thee behind me, Satan. And, and you are a stumbling block to me that he was faithful. And as Hebrews says, he endured till the end. He endured till the end, scorning its shame, the shame of the cross and the shame of your sin and my sin that he was bearing for us. He scorned that and he went ahead and he gave his life on Calvary for you and me. He didn't give up. He didn't say, I'm, I'm weak or I, I'm going to look ridiculous. He kept on going on and he finished and he accomplished his father's perfect will. And that is the charge for you and I today, that if we will accomplish the will of the father, if we will stay on track and endure till the end, if we will endure till the end, 
we will be in the promised land like they are and like Jesus has established for us. We will be there. We will, account, we will make it till the end. Whatever you need, whatever walls are in your life right now, whatever things that obstacles are, are in your path and, and that are, are taking place in your life, they can fall down flat if you worship the Lord, you do what's right, amen? You follow His path and you pray and you seek His face, amen? Those, those walls can come down. The same God who made the walls fall flat you know what else he did? He raised Jesus from the dead. He raised Jesus from the dead. He, he, uh, he was able to make those walls fall flat, and he was able to raise Jesus from the dead. And I, I would venture to say that raising somebody from the dead is a harder task than any problem that you and I can have on this earth. It doesn't get any tougher in our eyes than raising someone from the dead. Just as it was that way for them back in Jesus' time. Because it was when he raised Lazarus from the dead. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, the, the, the Pharisees said, that's it. That's it. We're done with this. We got to have him crucified. We got to get this ball rolling and get him crucified. He is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. And he's, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. He is capable of doing whatever he says, whatever you need on his terms and in his timing and in his way. All you have to do is trust him. Don't be like, don't be like the, the Israelites, that, the older generation. Don't be the, like that older generation that doubted and the obstacles look big, the walls look big, the, the people, the, the, the giants were there. If God promised it, if God said he can do it, he can and he will do it. We need to have the same, we need to have the same mentality as Jesus. When we're looking at at the things that are going on in our world, the things that are going on in our families, and people that don't realize the times that we're in and the availability, availability that you and I have to the power and the love of God, literally at our fingertips, at our, in our heart, in our mind, through our faith. As I said in Sunday school this morning, when Jesus, when he was going down the Mount, the Mount of Olives and getting ready to go into Jerusalem, and everybody been shouting and praising God. He knew that in a few days, those same people would say, crucify him. Almost every one of those same people would say, crucify him. Because God's timing wasn't their timing. God's timing wasn't their timing. They thought he was the one going to establish and, and kill all the enemies. And so... He realized and he knew that they did not know the times that they were in and who that and that the fact that the Son of God was coming into their very midst to bring them healing and deliverance from their sins. And the Bible says he wept. Now, you and I, we may look at that and think, he got a few tears. Maybe his disciples would be like, Maybe they didn't even notice as he's riding on that colt of a donkey. But in this term and in this Greek and in their heritage, when, the, when it says they wept, they didn't, they didn't cry silently. Um, some of you ladies may be familiar with this term. It was an ugly cry. You know what that means, right? When your makeup's running all over your face, you're going to snot. We talk about that at church camp when kids get touched down at the altar and they go, oh, they're just, yeah, it's everywhere, you know, because God's been touching them and they had an ugly cry. That's basically what Jesus did, except he doesn't wear makeup. He had a, he wept. It was intense. He was weeping, crying. You know, you see, you see them people from the Middle East when somebody dies and they mourn for them, boys, oh, you know, all over the place. This would have been similar to what Jesus was doing for the fact that the holy city, 
that had been established from the beginning and that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords was coming in and they would not accept him and take hold of the miracle that he was bringing to them. Salvation. You and I, we, for our, our not just our needs, do we need to have faith, but for others to be saved, we need to have faith and believe. I know we want to see certain things take place in this country. We want to see, we want to see a lot of things reversed that have taken place lately in this country. Amen. We want it. We want it. We want the best. We want the best thing. We want the best for our country and the best for our people. But one thing that we should never get sidetracked on through everything that goes on in our society, the ups and the downs, the financial instabilities and all of that is our objective is to share the gospel with other people. The good news that Jesus Christ died for our salvation. That plan has been is laced all throughout the Bible. And, and the word says that even before God laid the foundations of the earth, he had a plan. He had a plan already. You and I are part of that plan. We when we need that, that those spiritual healings or we need those physical healings, we know those financial miracles to take place, absolutely. Let's do that. Let's pray. Let's do it. But let us not neglect the gospel message that Jesus died and rose again. He died and rose again and is coming back one of these days to complete salvation, to have it complete yes we have that that it, it's there in the the death and the resurrection but as you continue to read that we endure till the end and at the end when he establishes that kingdom that 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 millennial reign when we are with him reigning there in heaven wherever we're at that's the that's the completion of salvation because after that point we don't have to worry about falling away. We don't have to worry about being enticed by the things of this world. Being dragged, you know, enticed by uh, our spiritual nature and given into temptation and being dragged away unto death, Paul said. We do, that's that's going to be over. That's going to be over. But for now, we have got to continue to get the message out. That above all of our our financial blessings or our financial needs, our, our physical needs, which those things are fine. People need to know that Jesus healed people. Jesus delivered people. People, there are people, a lot of people that's got demons uh, that are tormenting them. And they need prayers of deliverance, just as Jesus did that for people. But through it all, we cannot neglect the gospel message. All of that is part of the gospel. But that commitment part of the gospel where we say I'll pick up my cross and follow him he endured the shame he endured the pain and the misery for your sake and for my sake amen and he he kept his eyes on the prize and Hebrews says let us fix our eyes on Jesus Christ the author and perfecter of our faith. The things that you and I go to go through, the walls that, that we have to try to conquer that seems that the walls that we're, we're that are they seem 30 feet high and 20 feet thick that we're trying to get through and get through to other people and you know get get Jesus to other people or get through a miracle or whatever it may be. Those instances and those times, those miracles that will take place will perfect our faith. It tests our faith. And when our faith is tested, like it is getting more and more tested right now in our society, you can either, you can have that fight or flight mentality. You can either flee and give up or you can fight in Jesus Christ. Not with carnal weapons, but with the weapons of our warfare that are spiritual and are powerful. And they bring down strongholds. That's, that is 
That's our decision. But if we'll do that, he will continue to perfect our faith and we'll be strong in him as things get worse, as, as the more Christian persecution takes place in the end days. We will, be, we will have faith to stand like our brothers and sisters in other countries even right now. Even as, even as close as Canada being arrested and some in this country being fined for having church in a pandemic. It's happening. The persecution is happening and it's getting closer and closer to home. But through that persecution, as in the Bible and in other times, great revival can take place. So don't give up. Don't give up because the walls may look big and the walls may be, look thick and strong. God can, God can blow them down with his breath. Amen. His power. Stand with me this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Lord, we just come to you right now in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for your word. Lord God, we thank you for... Um, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for, God, what you want to continue to do for us in getting us through the walls, the mountains that are in our way, that seem to rise up in front of us like a ship that's out to sea and everything looks fine and then they run aground on a reef that they did not see. Lord, sometimes we come across those instances things that we didn't expect but you are faithful and all those that call on the name of the lord will be saved you will get us through it you will get us over it or you will get us around it and we trust you today and lord i just pray that each person in this room and everybody that's listening online or that will later god i pray that whatever Walls they feel like are in their lives, whether they're, they're uh, physical, mental, financial, job-related, social-related, relationship-related. God, that they would turn their eyes upon Jesus and seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, knowing that all these things will be added unto them, that you are there for us. But all the while, Father, us as Christians have got to still get the message of the gospel out. That this week of Passover, this holy week, reminds us of as we celebrate the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help us to not neglect. God, the word says not to neglect the meeting together but also the neglect of sharing the gospel, praying for each other, praying for others' needs, praying for uh, demons to be cast out and people to be saved, delivered, and healed, which is all part of the gospel message, Lord God, but that most of all that Jesus died and he rose again and we can have eternal life in him. Whatever this morning whatever walls that you have in your life or in your families, just wherever you're at right now, just say, Jesus, I give them to you. Lord, I need your strength. I need your wisdom and knowledge and understanding. I need to know, as Joshua asked the commander of the armies of the Lord, possibly Jesus himself, what do I do? What, 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 what do I do? And we'll wait on you. And those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We declare that in the name of Jesus. We're going to wait and we're going to serve and we're going to live. We're going to display Christ for the world in the name of Jesus.
Help us with these things, Father. And thank you that you will help us. We give you honor for that. Lord, I thank you for God, for Scott Hobart, Lord God, who is 61 days sober. And what a difference it's made in his life. And we just agree with him, Lord God, that you will continue to help him, God. And as he draws closer to you, Lord God, I know, Lord God, as we draw closer to you, those things fade away and we become more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Lord God, that wall is defeated. That wall has fallen flat. I pray that you help him and anyone else in that situation not to rebuild that wall, but to let it stay flat as we serve you and we give you the glory and the honor for it, God. We praise your name and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.